one has been uh, given a lot of homework to do, so much reading, so many facts, so many figures, only to reinforce what I already knew, you know, or, or most of us already know. Um, I, I, I can't obviously speak on behalf of the jury because we haven't had much time to talk to each other or to come out with any joint statement. But um, I was thinking about what Robert McNamara, who's probably one of the most famous presidents of the World Bank ever, I recently saw a film called The Fog of War, which is basically a long interview with him, where he was talking about his, one of his adolescent dilemmas, which was being involved in the bombing of Tokyo in which they killed 100,000 people in one night. And he said, how much evil does one have to do in order to do good? And uh, of course, as we know, he went on to kill more and more people and more and more people until he became the president of the World Bank he found different ways of doing the same thing. Um, one, of the, one of the things I think which is going to become uh, uh, something that the jury might hotly debate with each other is, um, you know, who are we talking to? What was all this for? Because, because eventually what has happened is that like Prashant said in his paper, the World Bank has levered itself into a position where the wall between the policy makers and the bank itself is entirely porous. So when they are working, they are here, and when they are holidaying, they're there, you know? And both are feeding into each other. And there isn't really a difference anymore, really, between the bank or these international financial instrument, institutions and the government, which we all vote for so enthusiastically all the time, you know, and which has its own sort of propaganda machine and Indian democracy is, is, the, is the new game in town, you know, the new superpower, the new, the new uh, sweetheart of the world, sort of the cuddly teddy bear compared to the slightly more dragon-like China. So, you know, look at these answers that they've given to, I think, some imagined questions. Basically, you know, if, if, if you have documents this high talking about how they tried to privatize the water of Delhi, their answer is, no, we didn't. That's what they've said here. We've never tried to privatize the water. And the whole thing is like, uh, you know, it's all, it's all about how you can produce counter facts and counter statistics and generally confuse everybody about what's going on. When we all know that what's actually going on is that, I mean, I was, I was very, very interested to, to listen to the presentation about, for example, how really the ADB and the World Bank are almost trying to sponsor the rule of law. How they're trying to create judicial reforms and the judiciary as we know is now the engine that controls the society in which we live in because democracy is too unpredictable and messy. So, so really, uh, you know, I think one, one, one thing is how do we resist this? Because where are we going to stop uh, you know, our chain of inquiry because eventually, of course, it goes into the whole, the whole neoliberal, neo-imperialist thing where whether, however good a government you are, even Nelson Mandela, who's also the cuddly toy of the 20th and 21st century, even Nelson Mandela, the day he came to power, had to, you know, bow down to this to this power and had to, had, had to uh, privatize everything in South Africa faster than anybody knew what happened. And if you don't do that, there's going to be capital flight. They're going to take out their money. So really, uh, you know, we are, we are involved in a very serious 
a debate about what to do about all this. You know, uh, the Narmada movement, I think, is one which is a wonderful example of how the World Bank, before a single study had been done, was there with its checkbook, ready to sign the money over for the dam. And then when the World Bank pulled out, the government took over. And when, uh, when the World Bank stopped funding dams for so many years, it was that Supreme Court judgment in the Narmada case that brought the World Bank right back in. So, you know, today if it's not the World Bank, it's going to be somebody else. Because what this, what this whole neoliberal policy has done is to create a huge constituency in India of middle class people who are willing to fight for this tooth and nail, who are willing to answer us who say why are not the rehabilitation policies in the Narmada project being adhered to, to say look, it doesn't matter how much evil do you have to do in order to go do good, somebody has to pay the price and that's how it's going to be. So eventually, I think, personally, the fight is going to go right back to the ground, you know, right back to not, uh, you know, not allowing people into the villages that you live in or not allowing them access. Those are the only areas, you know, one of the only areas where you don't see the kind of devastation and poverty that you see everywhere else in India is in Kashmir because the Indian government hasn't allowed, been allowed to do its development. So there are not homeless people, there are, there are not, you know, poor people and so on. Just, I mean, just as a writer, I want to say that one other really dangerous thing is that, you know, I, I said this many years ago too, that that as a writer you spend your life trying to evolve a language that precisely expresses what you think. And in organizations like the World Bank, they spend all their time doing exactly the opposite. They try to evolve a language that means exactly the opposite of what it actually means. So, you know, when you look at these presentations, you know that if they say natural resource management, it means mismanagement. If they say conservation, it means destruction. If they say deepening democracy, it means demolishing it. If they say empowering, it means disempowering. If they say sustainable, it means unsustainable. If they say integration, it means disintegration. So you almost have to develop a sort of filter through which you read these things to, to extract meaning from them. And um, beyond this, I, I don't know, you know, whether, uh, I, I don't know, <coughs> I think we don't know now how to fight, how to fight this. Because, you know, nonviolence, I don't know, it hasn't worked in the Narmada Valley. And violence brings all the myriad violences of the state down upon you. But the fact is that while we carry on winning the argument, we're losing the battle and losing the war and losing it fast. And, and I'm really very, very frightened about all this. Thanks.